Hello, and welcome to this meeting of the Council of the Town of Oakville. I invite you to join Council in O Canada. Thank you, everybody. Um, 210 years ago, indigenous people here began welcoming settlers from all over the empire. Soon, the new settlers were helping slaves escaping from the United States to settle here too. Today, our indigenous founding partners are still here enjoying this land with us. They fish and camp under their Treaty 22 rights. Indigenous people in their thousands also live with us as neighbors and friends. Our indigenous white and black settlers created a community with an attractive degree of harmony and prosperity. And by 1857, Ontario gave official recognition to Oakville as a town. At Town Hall 160 years later, we fly the flag of the Mississaugas of the Credit beside the flags of Oakville, Ontario, and Canada. We fly these flags together to acknowledge our origins. People from all over the world are attracted to the livability we have created. We offer newcomers a warm spirit of welcome. We offer everyone our founding story so that everyone can know what they are part of. We feel sorrow and distress for acts of racism and intolerance suffered across Canada. We want our future to be equitable and inclusive for all. The path of truth and reconciliation can lift and unite us. Now, before we begin our scheduled council meeting, it's important to me to note that June is the month during which we celebrate our community's indigenous history as well as pride. Our diversity is a vital reason for why Oakville can be and stay Canada's most livable town. Today is National Indigenous Peoples Day. We acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation as the traditional custodians of the land we inhabit by flying the Mississaugas of the Credit flag at Town Hall. In 2019, in fact, Council voted to add a permanent Indigenous flagpole at Town Hall for the continuous display of that flag. Tragically, this flag and all others at town facilities flew at half mast during the first week of June. This was done in honor of the 215 indigenous children, the, the bodies of 215 indigenous children found in a mass grave at a former residential school site in Kamloops, British Columbia. I would ask now for a, mo a moment of silence in, uh, in recognition of the event. Thank you, everybody. 
Uh, I would now like to um, give a brief statement uh, in comment of, uh, on a letter released uh, this afternoon uh, by our MPP for Oakville, Stephen Crawford, urging us to pass a resolution requesting the province to issue a minister's zoning order to uh, uh, preserve the Glen Abbey, uh, the cultural heritage landscape uh, known as Glen Abbey Golf Course. And this is the statement. We want to thank MPP Stephen Crawford for his letter. We're delighted with his support. Our officials are preparing the appropriate council resolution. The council response will be scheduled with the appropriate public notice. So thank you everybody for that. Uh, we have regrets, council, from Councillor Sandhu. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Madam Clerk, I don't see any. Council, uh, do you have corrections for the minutes listed in the agenda? And if you haven't, is there a mover and seconder to confirm them? Councillor Adams and Councillor Knoll, thank you. Any objection or corrections? Madam Clerk, there are none. The minutes are adopted. Uh, we now have the pleasure of receiving a public presentation from the new executive director of Oakville Galleries to update us on the, the galleries and uh, her plans to, uh, to lead that organization. Uh, Sally Frader, uh, uh, welcome. Uh, Council looks forward to working with you, as do I, and uh, we look forward to your information. You have, the, you have the Zoom, as we're saying these days. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Mayor Burton. I'm very happy and grateful to have the opportunity to address the town council and to speak about some of the um, activities that we have been working on since the beginning of the year. I'm especially excited to have the opportunity to engage with many of the councillors since the town of Oakville is one of our biggest supporters and, and partners in all of the work that we do. Um, next slide, please. So this is a picture of me. I thought I should begin by introducing myself to everyone. Um, as the mayor mentioned, my name is Sally Frader and I'm the executive director at Oakville Galleries. Wednesday will be the official marking of my third month in my role. Uh, I haven't been here very long in some ways. It does seem like a long time, but I haven't been in the role very long. To just give you a bit of background, um, I've been working in the cultural sector for close to 16 years. Uh, prior to beginning my role at Oakville Galleries, I was the curator of contemporary art at the Art Gallery of Guelph. I also worked um, as the artistic director at uh, Center 3 for artistic and social practice in Hamilton. And I most recently was working in the States as well. Um, I was the curator of modern and contemporary art at the Ulrich Museum of Art, which was a university museum in Wichita, Kansas. So next slide, please. I am assuming that everyone on council is familiar with Oakville Galleries, but in the event that some people may not be, um, we are an arts organization and we have the uh, fortune of having two, two sites. We are on the sunny shores of Lake Ontario in the beautiful setting of Gerlach Gardens. Next slide. And we are also, we also have a site at Centennial Square. And what I really appreciate is about having these two locations is that it allows us to engage with the community at different, at different sites or different locations. Next slide. We also have an outdoor sculpture collection and we are very fortunate for it because it has allowed visitors to continue to engage with our collection at a time when we're closed to the public. Um, this is an example of some of the work that is in the outdoor sculpture. A sculpture collection. We have a number of works by renowned Canadian and U.S. artists, such as this piece by Catherine Widgery. Next slide, please. And this other work by Liz Mager Channel. Um, as I mentioned, we're very fortunate whenever I drive up to the building where our administrative offices are at Gerlach Gardens. Um, I, I, 
I'm able to witness viewers engaging with these works. Um, next slide, please. So this year, before we went into our third lockdown, we were um, fortunate to be able to open two exhibitions to the public. In our Centennial Square location, we feature Diedrich Brackens, a Los Angeles-based artist, and his exhibition, Shape of a Fever Believer. The work um, featured weavings by the artist of, I believe there were seven weavings that explored themes of American literature, folklore, um, black, uh, queer, and black experiences of the um, American South. Um, the work in particular looked at the, at the rise of the um, AIDS epidemic or the recent sort of recurrence and rising rates in black and brown communities. Uh, next slide, please. This is another installation view of that exhibition. And we also had an exhibition at Gerlach Gardens. Next slide, please. By Senga Nengudi, who is a Colorado-based artist. She is an established artist. And her exhibition, Hourglass, featured works in sculpture. Um, she incorporates a lot of found materials, uh, water, plastic, and sand. She also featured works in video and and um, writing pieces as well. And the waterworks were a nice complement to the Gerlach Garden setting because it was in some ways a reference to Lake Ontario. Next slide, please. This is another ins installation view of Senga's show. Um, next slide. And what we're currently working on, one of the programs that we are working on, is an upcoming exhibition which will officially open on September 19th. It is called Two Truths and a Lie, and it is being organized by our assistant curator, Teresa Wong. And it features works from the collection. There will be, I believe, at least 16 works by 16 artists who are featured in the collection. And the exhibition, to give a very simple straightforward description, it looks at the ways in which we create myths and narrative and how we determine what is true or truth. Um, next slide, please. So last year, our camp sessions were very successful. We're just gearing up to launch our 2021 camp sessions. Our sessions are selling out. Um, we have smaller camp sizes to allow us to um, have students into the site or on site rather. But a lot of our programming, weather permitting, will be held outdoors and the smaller class sizes will um, allow us to operate the camps in accordance with municipal and provincial COVID guidelines. We're really excited about welcoming students and campers back to the galleries. Next slide, please. As many cultural organizations have had to do, we had to transition most of our course and workshop and public programs offerings to online platforms. So we use Zoom um, as we are doing this evening. And we also took advantage of Instagram. I was very taken with this initiative as many of our audience members were, visitors were, by our educator, Erica morgan Talley and our um, marketing and communications coordinator, Jordan Stewart. They created these Take 5 Studio videos, which, were, which provided step-by-step -step instructions, which allowed kids to make artwork at home with materials that they had on hand. They were very successful. Next slide, please. We also had a youth watercolor painting workshop um, this particular workshop, I believe, had 40 participants, and we were very excited about it. It uh, sold out very quickly. We had a long waiting list. We ended up allowing everyone who was on the waiting list into the workshop. And one of the things that um, transitioning to online platforms did was it allowed us to broaden our reach. So in our March break camp and also in this youth watercolor workshop, we had a few participants. One was from India, one was from the UK, which allowed us to broaden the scope of who we could serve through our, through our courses and workshops. Next slide, please. We also transitioned our public programs to being online. 
Um, this is a screenshot from one such program, which featured Justine A. Chambers, who is a Vancouver-based performance artist, and her frequent collaborator, Lori Young, who is also a performance-based artist. But currently, Lori is based in Australia, and Zoom allowed us to bring the two of them together to deliver their, their talk. We had 40 attendees which was quite great, um, particularly considering that a lot of people are having Zoom fatigue. Another point that I wanted to mention was our assistant curator led a tour of Diedrich's exhibition and Senga's exhibition, and we had 70 participants for that online tour, and then 80 people, 81 people rather, viewed it after the fact. So that was quite successful. I should also mention that both of those exhibitions received international reviews in leading art journals. Next slide, please. We've also tried to take advantage of our online presence or increase it rather. So next slide, please. We have established two new programs where we are offering um, highlights from our past um, Oak Hill Galleries catalog publications. And we've also started a program uh, called Collection Highlights and what what that program consists of are staff picks. We're each selecting a work and we are sharing what it is about this work that speaks to us. So it's allowing us, this is shared through Instagram, and this is allowing us not only to share more of our collection with the public, but it's also allowing us to provide um, tools for looking at art to our audiences. So for those who may not be as familiar with um, different ways of deciphering artworks, we're using um, layperson's language to describe the composition of works, to describe the concepts and the ideas behind them. And we're hoping to increase our engagement of, or the engagement of our programs through this platform. Next slide, please. So I'm going to wrap this up because I don't want to take up too much of your time. So what we're planning on doing in the next six months are really looking at the site because we likely will not be here for much longer. So we're trying to create programming that takes advantage of these beautiful gardens that we have and the wondrous Lake Ontario. So we're looking at um, developing a sign art project that could take place and take advantage of the gardens next year. We're looking at developing a performance program and also um, gallery based programming that explores themes of water, ecological issues, um, personal experiences with water, those types of things. We're looking at using our social media presence and online programming to continue to grow the reach of our audiences and to also develop different ways for local audiences to have to um, experiencing programming that capitalizes on their in-person experiences at the galleries. We are also really excited and I'm excited in particular that a lot of the COVID restrictions seem to be lifting because this will allow me an opportunity to go out and meet the different community partners in person. I've started having visits with um, uh, some of the senior cultural managers from the town. So I was really, I had a really great meeting with three of them last Friday. I'm looking forward to meeting more cultural groups in person and figuring out how we can collaborate on programming and how we can kind of grow the galleries and kind of grow our presence and make people more aware of what we do and make them feel more welcome. Um, and to do this, what we're going to do is we are going to develop a strategic plan, our recent one, um, was it like had a five-year scope and it recently ended. So I'm looking at developing a new one that will take my vision for the galleries into account, as well as input from the staff and our board and different community stakeholders. And that will lead us into the, fun, into the fundraising study um, that will um, help us to guide our vision for our next, our next home. So I think I'll just end things there. And I just want to, again, thank the mayor for the time um, to allow me to let you know what we've been up to and to introduce myself to the councillors. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm excited at the vision of public engagement that you're bringing to the job. This uh, institution that you're leading has a, a long and cherished relationship with the town. And uh, I'm hoping that together we can lift it to new heights of popularity and engagement with the public. And uh, I'll just uh, 
Uh, just in case, let me ask and if there's any counselors with questions for you before we let you go. Council, are there any questions for Ms. Frater? All right. Ms. Frater, thank you so much. I'm so glad you've uh, joined us. I really appreciate the information that you gave us. You have a very engaging way of telling the story, and I think that's going to do the galleries a, a world of good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, Council, uh, we, uh, we now come to the point in the agenda where we resolve into Committee of the Whole. If two of you will favor us with a motion and a second. Councillor Grant, I saw your hand before technology cut everybody away. Um, and I'm, uh, there's Councillor Liz Chinna. So there we go, Councillor Grant and Councillor Liz Chinna. Any objection? No objection being seen, that carries. Council, we have uh, uh, five consent items. And, uh, and one confidential consent item. I know you've studied these reports and, and uh, you're familiar with our consent custom. Uh, is there a mover for the consent items? Councilor O'Meara? Sir, Your Worship, I did. I was wondering if we could just maybe pull out the park names um, item for discussion. I have a question about that one. Sure. And then um, I'd be happy to move the rest. Thank you. Um, Council, is there any objection to the others? Madam Clerk, seeing none, uh, they're carried. Uh, Councilor O'Meara, park names. Did you want one named for anyone in particular? <laughs> well, we can come to that at a different point, I think. Um, but no, for this one, um, I just wanted to ask staff um, about the Bronte Square naming for the Lakeshore Road um park i believe that's going to be the market square in the new development at the mall um but i had thought that we had um had talked about a different name for that rather than bronte square i thought that we had talked about um uh, harbor square or or there was a different name for that i i just uh I'm, I'm not sure if that's the if that's the name that we had agreed upon or not so maybe staff can can speak to that if that's okay all right well um is, is uh, Mr. Mark available and in his place, uh, commission, um, CAO Closey? I believe you have Chris Mark on the line now. All righty. Oh, there he is. Welcome, Mark. Good evening, Good evening Mayor Burton and members of council. Uh, Councilor O'Meara, we did go back and forth on a number of occasions, as you'd indicated, uh, with various names. The one regarding Harbor Square, we were a bit concerned because we already have a Harborside Park. Um, but if you wish to uh, take that one out of uh, the agenda for this evening, we could certainly have some further discussion with you on that and come back at a later date. Uh, it's not going to be built just quite yet, so we can still have some further discussion if you prefer on the naming of that square. Yeah, I, I, if we could do that, I'd appreciate it. Brawny is a very long road, and, and I, I'd just like to make sure we've got something that's speaks specific to the area that 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 people won't go you mean the brawny up at here or there so yeah perhaps we can if we don't mind we can have a little more discussion over that one if that's okay all right absolutely that that works and counselor your motion assuming you still want to move it would be that we approve all but that one and then that leaves that one open for you and uh that, if you've agreed fantastic. if i get I, I take it i have your agreement to that and I just saw a hand from Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. Uh, Mayor Burton, I had my hand up earlier about 7.5, but I'm fine with um, with what Councillor Mayor is doing. I just had a question on 7.5, which got moved without my hand being seen. So I just, when it's appropriate, I'd like to ask that question. Well, you you can ask that anytime now or or offline later, depending on what the need is. Like sometimes we want to ask a question for the benefit of the, of the public, but so it's your choice. Well, my question is just in terms of privacy on the on seven point five, that when they put the sticker on the door, um, is it in an envelope such that um, you know, you know, an individual's pro you know issues related to a property standard are are not for everybody to read on their doorstep, um, and it's it's a technical. Kind of procedural thing but it does speak to you know giving some people um a sense of privacy that not everybody needs to know what they violated this week mr barry is here to reassure you 
Mr. Barry? <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, when property standards orders or, um, or lot maintenance orders are issued, they are put on the door visible, and the intent is for them to be visible so if somebody can actually see that an order has been issued. And that's, that's been the general way we've, uh, most municipalities deal with property standards and lot maintenance orders. Yeah, when the weeds, when the grass is 12 inches high, everybody in the neighborhood wants to know they've been served, I guess is the way to put it. So, so I understand that, but are there some that are more sensitive where some judgment is used? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, properties, they, they do become part of the public record. So they're not something that's uh, protected by freedom of information or something we would, um, in any case, with a property standards or lot maintenance, decide to keep them secretive in any way, um, unlike certain charges that might be uh, Provincial Offenses Act charge. Okay, thanks for clarifying that for me. So the bottom line is keep your property in order. All right, council, thank you. Uh, we can now move to uh, the discussion items. We have uh, five of those and one confidential discussion item. And the first discussion item is the COVID-19 update from our CAO, Jane Closey. Ms. Closey, you have the Zoom. Uh, Mayor and members of council, I've got a brief update for you today. Uh, things are really looking up and being positive. And you can definitely see this from the graph here. Uh, the sharp decline of the, the line in the last couple of uh, weeks actually has been quite outstanding. I think there is 270 cases in Ontario today, of which uh, that's the lowest we've seen si since September the 15th. So that certainly is welcome news. Uh, and I think everyone is feeling a great deal of relief as the numbers start to drop down. I think the only caution is the Delta variant is still there, and it is a little bit uncertain what kind of an impact it, ha it will have. But as the number of people get um, the vaccinations, their two dosages, um, and uh, the numbers continue to decline, we should hopefully stay in a very positive position. So as you know, the province started on June 11th with step one uh, in a three-step process in order to move us through the balance of this uh, pandemic. Um, and we have responded with all of the services uh, in terms of the town uh, in getting them open and running in accordance with that step one. When they had first announced the uh, step process, uh, they had indicated that in order to move from step one to step two, which you can see at the top of the chart, is that 70% of the adults need to have their first dosage and 20% the full vaccination. And at this point in time, Ontario has met both of those requirements. We stand at about 74% uh, for those receiving their first uh, dosage and about 21% uh, having been fully vaccinated. They also said in their announcement that uh, they would leave 21 days between the two. So if we use that as a measure, uh, that would mean that on July the 1st, we could potentially see us moving to step two. But I think as I had said at the last uh, meeting, uh, I can't give you any certainty of any dates in, in moving forward. There has been a lot of positive talk about perhaps opening a few days earlier than that. So really it is a provincial decision and we'll leave it up to them how, when they want to move us into step two. But the dosages certainly um, is uh, in favor of moving along quickly. So specific on the vaccination program, you can see the numbers there. This is specific for Halton. Uh, we have about 76 of our population actually uh, with the first vaccination and uh, just under 20% with the second vaccination. So the region has been consistently accelerating uh, the, um, sec the timing of your second dosage. And I think at this point in time, anyone has, who has been vaccinated prior to uh, May the 30th then are eligible to rebook their second appointment at an earlier date. So the best place to really look for any changes in the vaccination, of course, is the region's website. It is all dependent on the supply. We have heard this week that the Pfizer supply has been delayed 
uh, which means that the region is now shifting over to Moderna for the next couple of days before getting a better understanding of what is the supply coming in. So the region's website is the best place to look. Uh, the vaccinations, though, are proceeding as they were originally planned, just with some changes. So positive news on the vaccination front, most definitely. We had some other promising news today. I think everyone is uh, anxious to travel. Um, right now, what has been announced, and it was just announced this morning, so uh, uh, these are a few facts that I have from it, is that uh, uh, Canadians and permanent residents that are fully vaccinated can come into ca Canada without requiring the self-quarantining as of, uh, I think it's midnight of July 5th. Um, so that's, that's positive news. Yeah. They are working towards the vaccine uh, passport, has been talked about for the last couple of weeks, and so they're expecting to have that approved and available, which would give uh, the certification for those traveling into the country to be able to travel. Uh, at this point in time, the uh, U.S. border remains closed, um, and it's, so it's only at this point that we understand that the uh, Canadians and permanent residents can move across the borders but we expect those things to be unraveling fairly quickly, uh, unraveling, uh, progressing, so that more of us can travel, which is, again, some positive news, getting back to normal again. In terms of a staff update, <coughs> excuse me, there are three pieces I just wanted to update on you. Vaccination program, we're continuing to encourage staff to get vaccinated as soon as possible, and so they've been watching their own websites and the places that they live, and we've been giving them every opportunity with staff time in order to go out and get their vaccination. Um, so that's proceeding very well. And I think as we had talked the last time, we're not tracking that because it's not really something we, we can track and do really anything with. Um, but the encouragement is there in all correspondence with staff. We had also done our second pulse survey. Uh, it was about, I think it was the end of May that we had done it. And it's a, an opportunity to measure um, staff's engagement. Uh, and we had a fairly good response rate, about 58% of the staff um, responded to the survey, which is quite good. Uh, and, uh, and the uh, company who undertakes the Pulse survey on our behalf uh, measures the uh, engagement or, or um, engagement score. And we sit within the high perform highly performing staff group, anyone over 60%, based on a series of questions they ask fit within that group, and we're at about 78% uh, in terms of the engagement of staff in the work that they do, which is a very positive number. Um, there are some, of course, with any survey, you get some feedback in terms of the things that we need to be doing, uh, in terms of some of our mental health programs, improving our employee engagement, our employee support programs. Uh, those types of things. And there was a definite um, response rate between internal staff and the, the staff that are constantly on site and staff that are off site working remotely. So it's another piece that we need to deal with in terms of staff morale and moving back uh, forward. Uh, the last piece is um, we have improved uh, as of June 1st some of the access to mental health benefits. Mental health is an ongoing issue throughout the community. Um, and our staff are equally affected by that. Um, and so we've made some improvements to that program so that they have better access and quicker access to mental health supports through our employee assistance program. So that's some of the changes that we've done on the staff uh, as a staff update. Municipal enforcement, certainly with the uh, uh, new nice weather that we have, have been out on an ongoing basis. Um, they're certainly taxed with um, uh, the anxiousness for everyone to get back to normal. So they have been responding to these series of um, concerns that have been out there in the community, uh, and they're listed there. Actually, I won't repeat them. So that has been a, an active uh, role for municipal enforcement. I provided this slide, I think, at the last presentation. It's just a reminder of all the town services that are open as a result of step one. And so that's where we sit at this point in time. Moving into step two, uh, whenever that happens by the province, uh, we'll increase some of the capacity limits in the outdoor areas. Uh, and it'll start to introduce some small indoor gatherings that could occur. 
So the kinds of town services that would be impacted by that would be our sports fields could move into more of a fully permitting process. Um, outdoor tours, for example, at Oakville Museum could start. Uh, some wedding ceremony events within our parks and our facilities. Uh, but that would be almost it in terms of the step two. Step three moves us into a lot more opportunities for indoor activities. There are some library improvements too, just in terms of having access to the stacks. So those are town services. And of course our message has been going forward, uh, particularly through municipal enforcement is uh, be kind. We're going to get through this and it looks like we're moving in a very, very positive direction in the last little while and let's hope we all continue so we can get back to seeing each other again. So thank you very much. Mayor, any questions? Thank you very much, CAO. Council, do you have questions? Uh, Councillor Adams. Thanks very much for the presentation. And yes, things are looking good. A um, couple of questions for uh, how Town Hall is operating. Are we uh, looking at uh, bringing, bringing things back into Town Hall in terms of um, actually having public meetings and that sort of thing? Um, once we get into the final stage? As we move into, well, let me update in terms of what we have for Town Hall at this point in time. Service Oakville is open. Uh, it opened as we moved into step one, so anyone can come into the facility to do business at Service Oakville. We do, though, have almost everything online, so you can always access through that venue, and it's probably the best and easiest one for people to uh, go to. In terms of public meetings, um, I don't expect those to happen into step three or perhaps even beyond just because of the gathering limits indoors. I think it's part of step two, we move to five people. And I think as, uh, yeah, I don't have the numbers for the uh, step three. So we have not put in our plans moving into public meetings or returning to a council format at this point in time. Uh, the social distancing limits need to be reduced in order to, for us to be able to accommodate that in the facilities that we do have. Great. And then the, the last question I have for you is, uh, we still have emergency um, uh, declarations in place uh, throughout the region. Uh, has there been discussion among the uh, senior staff around the need to continue having that? And if not, at what point would we start having a discussion about uh, in a joint kind of way, stepping away from those emergency declarations. So we have had uh, some discussions uh, as a group of Halton CAOs for the four municipalities in the region. Um, our general consensus, our consensus was that um, at this point in time, just entering or just moving into the step one uh, was not an appropriate time to be taking a lot of the emergency declaration off. We have the Delta variant, which is still a bit of a a little bit of a wild card and understanding what that implication could or could not be uh, needs to happen. So as we move into the steps, really as we start to get into step three is the time frame that we could start to consider the removal of the uh, emergency declaration. Great, thank you so much for everything that you and all the staff are doing uh, and continuing to do. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Robertson. Thank you for the report, Jane. It, um, it helps to clarify things, especially go into stages. I've had community concerns about summer camps and how they will be running and what's happening if they're running in private facilities and what ha and how is that addressed by the town. Uh, so I would actually uh, ask uh, if Doug Carr is on to perhaps set out what are the requirements for summer camps, because there certainly is a distinction between the indoor and the outdoor uh, components of them, if Doug is on. If not, I know I have Jim Barry here who may be able to speak to that component. And then following that, um, uh, Councillor Robinson, it's a question is about the camps that we ourselves are offering. Um, Colleen Bell can deal with that. So I don't see Doug, but Jim is here. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I understand that, uh, that some of the concern is the activity actually being held at, uh, at some of the summer camps, and that has made its way to municipal enforcement. 
we are looking at uh, individual circumstances of each of the camps that uh, ha have been brought to our attention. But in general, um, sports that would be played inside, um, such as hockey or, or that type of activity, um, shouldn't be played inside uh, as of the current state we're at, their current uh, level we're at. So if that's the case, uh, enforcement staff will be out, find out what exactly is going on and, and make sure that they're in compliance over the next uh, short period of time. Thank you, because I know that camps are already on the list this week because private schools are out already. So some camps are already running. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the only thing I would uh, advise that some of the camps I did look at, although they were registering uh, now, it was for a camp that was later in the summer. Uh, it is possible that they are anticipating a, a move to another level, which, may, which they then may comply at. But uh, as, as enforcement staff uh, look at the individual circumstances, we'll uh, be able to determine better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, uh, Councillor Lischina, you had your, oh, you do have your electric hand up. You have the Zoom. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, I guess it was just a follow up to Councillor Robertson's question, and I thought that um, Commissioner Bell was going to mention it. I was curious about uh, our wait, uh, wait times for our camps, how, how that's been going. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so we currently have two, uh, 2,940 uh, campers ready to go out of a possible 3,386 placements right now. We have 947 uh, pe uh, registrants on the wait list. However, uh, some of the people that are on the wait list are, are actually um, looking at later times. Um, so uh, we had a huge uptake and we're really pleased to uh, uh, be able to process so many. This is almost double uh, the number of placements that we were doing at this time last year. So we're definitely on the right track. That's great to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor has a deal. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Jim wants me to ask this question now or... Uh, when he gets to Waterfront Park, but I have a question about parks on patrol and about resource allocation across the parks, including kind of evening coverage, um, uh, because uh, while we're making great progress, we're also starting to see uh, evening behavior being challenging um, to the point of disrupting people's sleep and, and uh, people are concerned about the response times and um, perhaps Jim could give us all uh, uh, some greater insight into how the resources are spread across all of our great parks and including uh, covering uh, the waterfront. I'm going to suggest that Jim gives you that update now rather than as part of the waterfront parking. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to the councillor. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, there's quite a lot happening in our, our parks and waterfront areas now. So, um, uh, as indicated uh, earlier this year, when we uh, when we brought on our park uh, officers and, and park ambassadors, we have several locations across the town with static uh, officers and ambassadors on on site, which include Brawny Bluffs, uh, Tannery Park, and Coronation Park. So we have officers and ambassadors there on a, on an ongoing, regular basis. We also have a list of uh, other parks and, and uh, it, it really goes through most of the parks we have where we have mobile patrols on with our parks officers and uh, an even larger list uh, where we have uh, parks ambassadors going to them. So visiting them on a, on a regular basis, usually once or twice a day. Um, to address the, the issues on uh, long weekends, we have extra staff in and, and I'll just remind council we, we hired uh, 16 park officers, uh, eight of them are uh, full-time and the rest are part-time. So we use those staff to augment uh, any, any vacations or sick time that occur, but also to main, make sure we have a, a static number of staff visiting our parks on a regular basis. We also hired an additional, um, and this is for the year, um, not, not on an ongoing basis, but eight additional uh, mobile compliance officers to augment the 12 we have, and they're here till December and they also um, add, uh, add staff to the daily um, daily uh, platoon numbers. So we have a, a, certainly an increased number of staff available to respond to calls. 
If I look at uh, just hours um, between uh, May 21st and June 20th, we've had um, our park officers have done 504 patrols of parks that have taken up about 280 hours of staff time. Our uh, police on uh, parks patrol program have uh, been out 20 times. Um, and our ambassadors have uh, conducted 1,385 patrols uh, with about 1,743 hours of staff time. So as you can see, we're spending a, a quite a bit of time out in the parks um, trying to get the word out and uh, make sure people are complying with regulations. Um, thank you for that. As a follow-up, um, is there a mobile support um, into the evening? So I'm excited about the fact that we're going to actually put potentially a, day, a time on uh, dusk uh, when the parks close, but what is the resource support um, later in the evening? So there's no question we're doing um, you know, everybody is working hard throughout the day. I, I just don't know that we have clarity about what's happening in the evening. And, and perhaps you could give us some advice around, uh, is it still call, um, let's call into the non-urgent or the 911 if, if the noise or um, the behavior is unacceptable to um, people in the community? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I, I would recommend calling the town number, 905-845-6601, uh, uh, and that's 24-7. Uh, residents uh, will get a response from municipal enforcement. The other non-emergency police number, um, 905-8254-777, um, they can also call that, um, but uh, for the most part, we like to direct uh, bylaw matters to the town where possible. Um, and with respect to your question about um, into the evening, we have, we have a tiered response to that. Um, again, we have the eight additional mobile compliance officers that have uh, been hired for the year, um, bringing our numbers up to about 20 officers, and they're on shift 24-7. So you're always going to have three, four, five officers on duty to respond to those calls. Um, our parks officers, that's a, that augments that group, and they work till about 10 o'clock, uh, depending on timing. Uh, we don't like to keep them out in, in the parks too late because they are out there on their own and they're a, a level down from the mobile compliance officers. And our parks ambassadors are really the same thing. We like to bring uh, them in around dark, um, just making sure that they're not out in the park after that. Um, I will note that we also have our municipal standards investigators uh, out during the day, but they also work into the evening and assist our mobile compliance officers as well. Um, so this additional detail is helpful, and, and hopefully some of the public has noted some of those numbers, et cetera. Um, so for 100% clarity, if if they're they're uh, just making a heck of a racket, um, and potentially, I mean, they could be drinking or whatever in the parks or on the road network there, you want them to call the town's uh, number? And is it is is the... Is there a sense of a response time? Because we often get asked, you know, how, will somebody get out here quickly? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what I can say is it, it'll get dispatched into our system right away. So as soon as they call in, the call taker will take it, it'll go into the system. Response time is a little more difficult for me to speak to because depending on the volume of calls coming in, officers are out in the field. It could take, you know, a significant amount of time at one call, which will delay them um, responding to other calls. So. Um, if they call that number, it will go into the system right away. It, officers will pick it up in priority and, and respond to the call as soon as they possibly can. Again, thank you for that. So from your experience and with your insight with your colleagues across the province, are, do you feel we are staffed at the level um, to address um, the demand or um, are there any, is there anything else you need from council um, to support uh, the requirements in the parks and uh, in the evenings. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I think we've got an excellent program. I, I would uh, I would put the program we, we've put together up against any other in the province. Um, there's always going to be um, uh, times when um, there's more activity in the in the community than we can ever respond to it. But we will get to those calls, and if it's a repeating situation, officers will get out there the next time and, and make sure we get to it. Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. Um, seeing no more questions, is there a motion to receive? Councillor Giddings, thank you very much. Any objection? Madam Clerk, being no objection seen, that's carried. All right, Council, uh, we now turn to 9.2, the Waterfront Parks Parking Improvements Proposed Bylaws, uh, Bylaw 2021-80 and Bylaw 2021-82. Um, we have uh, Hanya Ellison, the Manager of Strategy and Support Services with us for your questions, and uh, she has a slideshow for you as well, which may assist the public to understand it as well. Uh, so, Ms. Ellison, uh, you have the, the Zoom. Thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Burton, members of council. We have before you a report and recommendations to make improvements to parking lots at waterfront parks. As well, the report provides for some options for council's consideration should they wish to increase control and management of parking lots at Brawny Beach and Tannery Park. Sorry, am I doing it? Okay. There we go. Um, as you may recall, uh, CAO updates last year, there were significant amounts of visitors to Oakville's waterfront parks, resulting in overcrowding and concerns at the parking lots. Um, just some perspective, we have stats from en Enveronics uh, regarding visits to Brawny Beach Park. In 2019, between May 1st and September 30th, in 2019, it was 68,000 visits. And for the same time in 2020, there was almost 120,000 visits. So there was a significant increase. A lot of that could be related to COVID. Um, a number of programs were implemented last year to help address those concerns, and some have in, um, increased into this year as well. Parks Ambassador, Police on Parks, con Police on Parks Patrol, um, social media campaigns. You know, if the parking lot is full, please come back another time, enjoy one of our other parks, as well as special provision areas to help um, deal with uh, parking restrictions and um, overflow parking into residential areas. With the increased number of visitors to the parks, there was increased parking demand and officers observed numbers of, uh, of vehicle issues, including vehicles parked on the grass, on roadways, obstructing access, blocking vehicles without permits in permit areas, parking overnight, storing their vehicles in parks and um, also overflow into residential areas. Um, we have numerous um, pictures, however, um, the best ones are the ones on the grass. Showing a car parked overnight is kind of a difficult picture to look at. But uh, as a result of the increased park issues, there were increased parking violations. Again, comparing 2019 in Brawny Beach Park, we saw 137 tickets for the same time in 2020, it was over 500 tickets. So as a result of these uh, issues and increases, um, staff undertook a review of parking lots at waterfront parks, and it was focusing really on how the lots were used. For 2021, the focus of improvements were, uh, were at Brawny Beach Park and Tannery Parks. These areas were identified as high use, um, and numerous issues. Both areas provide for mooring permit holders and park and public visitors. As well at Brawny Beach, there's also boat operators with vehicles that are using the, uh, the boat launch and their visitors and events at Sovereign House. And both areas have multiple parking lots. Just to give a perspective or an, uh, sort of a view of Brawny Beach, there is a main parking lot, a gravel parking lot on West River Street, Berta Point that provides just permit holder parking. Brawny Harbor Yacht Club has a very small area and as well Brawny Bluffs and Sovereign House parking lot um, is used both by visitors to Sovereign House as well as visitors to the overall park area. Note that there are 143 boats at Brawny Beach and Berta Point together, and each of those permit holders is provided two parking passes. If these permit holders can't find enough parking in the permit-only areas, they park in the public parking spaces, again, on a first-come, first-served basis. Similarly, um, at Tannery Park area, there's three parking areas, Tannery Park itself, um, a Walker Street parking lot, and on-street parking in Walker Street where perpendicular parking was reconstructed and lined. 
Um, again, there are uh, boat permit holders there at Henry Park Oyster Bay. And with that, each permit holder is provided two parking passes. And similar to Brawny Beach, if these permit holders can't find parking in the permit only area, they are parking in the public parking. So the review that we undertook um, identified a number of options that improve the parking management and control at the parking lots at, the, at these parks. Amendments to the parks bylaw to clarify parking restrictions and regulations, signage to show parking requirements, timelines and restrictions, delineating the parking spaces and areas. Um, this would be subject to budget and funding approvals, adding bike racks to the parks to promote uh, cycling to the parks, again, subject to budget and funding approvals, and promoting cycling to the parks so that they wouldn't impact uh, the parking lots as cars wouldn't be needed if there's a bicycle there. Options to increase parking control and management also were considered such as time restrictions and paid parking to promote turnover of parking spaces. Um, creating additional parking if available is a really great opportunity um, and we did identify this at Brawny Marina which could help um, some of the overflow parking to Brawny Beach and controlling overflow parking into residential areas. Council earlier uh, this spring approved um, special provision areas um, and these have been implemented in Brawny Beach, Tannery, Coronation and Lyons Valley to prohibit overflow parking into the residential areas. As with any new parking programs, communication is critical to advise residents, visitors to the parks of the rules and regulations. With respect to the recommended bylaw updates, uh, we have a number of, um, of staff recommendations. First of all is the park closure. The current parks bylaw uh, states that the parks are closed between dusk and they open at 6 a.m. Staff are recommending that a 10 p.m. closure as a fixed time to make it clearer and easier for everyone to understand when is dusk. I actually found out when reading this that there's actually three types of dusk, um, but we won't go into that. The 10 p.m. closure does not preclude walking through the park if you're walking your dog through the park or taking a stroll through the park. It also doesn't prevent being in the park for an approved activity. For example, mooring permit holders who have their boats at the, um, at the waterfront parks would be permitted to be there, as well if there's any special events. With the recommended uh, bylaw amendment closing, closing the parks at 10 p.m., we're also recommending that parking be prohibited when the park is closed. Again, if there's a vehicle there for a permitted use, it can remain in the park um, until that permitted use is concluded. There are also a number of other recommendations to clarify the parking um, in prohibited areas, including parking other than on roadway or the parking lot. As the previous photo showed, a lot of vehicles parking on the grass when they can't find parking. Um, officers have to use a violation of parks um, a park on private property where prohibited. And it's not clear to the, the, the ticket recipient why they got the ticket. So what we're trying to do is really clarify when they get the ticket, they know why they, why they, were, why they got the ticket and why they were parking illegally. Um, as well, there's other amendments um, to the bylaw we're re recommending as housekeeping amendments to prohibit in, um, inoperable, unlicensed, or commercial vehicles. These are similar regulations we have in other uh, parking bylaws, to, so it makes it consistent, but also to deal with things as we have in the past where people just leave their vehicles um, in the parks because they don't have enough parking in their, in their property or they have an inoperable vehicle and can't deal with it. So we also looked at another, other, uh, a number of other options to control parking um, for consideration. And we looked at what other municipalities are doing, such as Ajax, Barrie, Burlington, um, St. Catharines, and a number of others, as their waterfront parks uh, are also popular. Some of the things we considered that would be effective uh, would be ease of use, ability to enforce, difficulty to misuse, a system that is equitable, provides for time limits and restrictions, uh, creates increased access through turnover of parking spaces and opportunity for cost recovery. A number of municipalities are implementing paid parking for out-of-town visitors, but are issuing permits to residents. While permits may be easy to use and easy to enforce, the permit program can hinder time limits and delay turnover of parking spaces. 
Um, if you have to require personal information to verify residency, there's a risk of you know, information breach. If there's no confirmation of residency, the program is open to misuse. Providing residents parking can also create an expectation that they have a permit so they should be able to have a guaranteed parking space. However, with the limited parking, that might not be the case. As well, it can be costly, costly to operate. One of the municipalities we, we looked at, they actually mailed permits to every resident. So we asked um, our friends in the tax department how many residential properties we have in Oakville. It's over 74,000. So based on the cost of the permit and mailing it, that would cost us over 350,000 just to implement such a program. So there would have to be other ways to do it. And communities we looked at that implemented residential permit parking programs at their waterfronts tended to have a number of parking areas and options um, for their visitors. As Brawny Beach and Tannery provide parking for mooring permit holders, the availability of visitor parking can be limited on any day. We also looked at time restrictions um, as a tool for managing the parking laws. The shorter the time, the time limit, the more turnover there is for parking, the more turnover, the greater the opportunity for available parking. Setting a time limit can allow visitors to enjoy the park while providing opportunity for more visitors to attend and equitable for all visitors. However, time limits alone without a system of payment or reservation requires increased enforcement resources by having to have multiple patrols. And as a result, vehicles can be parked significantly longer um, than the time limit before they're actually ticketed or enforced. We also looked at um, a reservation system similar to, to what Conservation Halton provides. This can provide um, for time limits, promote turnover, and op op options for cost recovery, and every visitor would have the same access. Um, it would, it is, there's a significant cost to it. Uh, we would require an online reservation system, electronic gates, or staff in attendance to verify registration, entry lanes to provide some queuing, queuing areas, and you'd have to either underutilize the parking to ensure the reserve space is available when someone shows up for the reservation. Uh, from the review of the reservation system, it would be difficult and costly to implement at Brawny Beach and Tannery. There are, as there are not a static number of areas for permit holders, so the situation with mooring permit holders changes from day to day. And the areas have multiple, uh, multiple accesses, so you'd have multiple entry points. The cost to implement would exceed over $130,000, not counting uh, parking lot configuration, maintenance, and traffic management plans. The Conservation Halton uh, program is very effective, however, they're implementing this at 10 locations. So I'm not sure if this would work for our locations at Tannery and Brawny. So another option um, to manage and control parking is paid parking. It does um, encourage compliance with time restrictions, promotes turnover of parking spaces, thereby creating more opportunity for parking. It's a common way to control and manage parking. It's equitable for all visitors on a first come first serve basis. It's easy to use and understand, it's enforceable, and it promotes a user pay system. So we received a lot of feedback uh, following the May 25th report to council where we were suggesting paid parking uh, every day throughout the year. There are options to implement a refined program that limits paid parking only during the peak times, perhaps three, $3 an hour for up to four hours, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., Friday, Saturday, Sundays, holidays, May 1st to September, using the Honk app to leverage for the payments. This could be a pilot program um, over a two year period to provide time to gather data and usage and limiting it to the two locations would also give time to implement and manage the program. If it were a pilot program, staff would report back um, after the pilot period and determine next steps. Another issue with controlling the parking in the, uh, around the waterfront parks is overflow parking into the residential areas. So with, when the lots get full, people are looking for other parking on the streets. In response to th these issues in 2020, special provision areas were first implemented with restrictions, higher penalties, and resident permits. 
Following Council's approval in April 26 this year, SBAs have been implemented from May 15th to September 15th in Brawny Beach, Tannery Park, Coronation Park, and Lyons Valley Park areas. The SPA forms part of the overall parking control and management for waterfront park areas. The question of removing an SPA could increase traffic uh, from vehicles circulating and looking for additional parking if the lots are full. Most of the streets within the uh, current SPAs have some permanent assigned areas as no parking. With increased traffic volume, the experience suggests increased parking violations that could impact safety sight lines and access. It is not uncommon to prohibit parking or limit parking in areas near waterfront parks um, as we were reviewing other municipalities and found that Ajax, Barry, Collingwood, Hamilton, Innisville, Mississauga, and St. Catharines have also done so. As well, there have been a number of inquiries about adding special provision areas near parks such uh, South Shell, Arkendo, Gerlock, and Lake Sard. Using the approved process that was outlined in the April 26 report to Council, any additional SPA areas would, uh, would only be implemented after consultation with the ward councillors and residents within the impacted area. So while we uh, looked at a number of options for controlling um, and managing parking, including uh, permits, reservations, and paid parking, what we are recommending in this report um, are a number of improvements specific to, uh, well, some are broader with bylaw amendments, but some are specific to Brawny Beach and, and Tannery Park. We're looking at the bylaw amendments to clarify the restrictions and regulations as outlined, signage to show clear conditions and timelines for the parking restrictions. We'd like to update the mooring permit holders information and clarify the terms and conditions, coordinate with Sovereign House members and uh, Brawny Historical um, Society to assist with parking for their events, delineating the parking spaces in areas uh, subject to budget and funding to try and reduce uh, parking that, uh, that uh, creeps onto the grass or outside of the parking areas, adding bike racks and promoting cycling to the parks um, would help reduce the number of vehicles coming to the parks, creating a temporary parking area at Brawny Marina, for the summer season to help with some of the overflow parking at Brawny Beach and communicate the parking programs um, and any changes. Sorry. Uh, we do have um, optional recommendations should council wish to increase management and control of parking at the Brawny Beach and Tannery Park areas. These are included on Appendix E of the staff report. These include implementation of paid parking pilot program, including bringing bylaw amendments to the next council meeting to implement the program, implementing resident parking permit program, again, subject to funding availability and bringing amendments forward for next council for implementing the program, and reporting back to council on cost to implement a reservation system at Brawny Beach and Tannery Park, should council wish that. Subject to the direction we receive from Council, we will work with communications to, to update information on website, news releases, social media, promoting biking, walking, transit to the parks, working with the parks ambassadors and officers to ensure that they can inform park visitors of the parking changes and um, any, any things that impact them, signage to, uh, to show the parking terms and conditions, informing the, the uh, mooring permit holders of parking changes, and working with Sovereign House representatives to, uh, to help coordinate with their plans and events for parking their parking needs. Again, should Council um, approve the staff recommendations, we would work with communications to implement the, the communication program, update the signage, working with parks, working with parks to implement temporary parking at Brawny Marina, um, working on installing bike racks, delineating parking areas as much as we can subject to available funding, providing information and updates to permit holders, and working with frontline and enforcement staff to ensure they understand programs and parking changes so they can inform and educate visitors. So I understand there may have been some confusion as to what we are recommending, and I just wanted to summarize uh, with this previous slide. This is what we are asking for in the recommendations to the report. Bylaw amendments to clarify restrictions, parking restrictions and regulations, including a 10 p.m. closing, no parking when the park is closed, prohibited uh, updates to prohibited parking areas and unauthorized vehicles. 
Um, improving signage to show clear parking conditions at the parks, updating permit holders information, working with Sovereign House members to assist with their parking for their events, delineating the parking spaces and parking areas so that people aren't parking outside of those areas, adding bike racks, promoting cycling to reduce the number of vehicles, creating a temporary public parking lot at um, Brawny Maria and communicating the programs and changes. So I can leave this, uh, this just to show what we're recommending, and that concludes my presentations, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Well, you have a few, and thank you very much for the report. I really appreciate the clarity you brought to uh, what you're proposing. The, um, and, you know, I can't help myself commenting that it seems a very measured response to the various and fairly... Uh, fairly large response that we've had from the public over these uh, last couple of cycles. So I've got a, I've got a questioner's list, and uh, it, uh, oh yeah. Okay, so my questioners are Councillor Chisholm, Councillor O'Meara, Councillor Duddock, Councillor Adams, and Councillor Giddings. And uh, any others that pop up from time to time, we'll, we'll fold you in. Councillor Chisholm. Your Worship. Uh, so to interject, but uh, my apologies. I think Councillor Duddock was first on the uh, on the list. Well, uh, fine, Councillor Duddock. Thank you, thank you, uh, Councillor Chisholm, for that. Um, thank you very much for the clarification for the uh, report, and I can appreciate it was um, very complex, shall we say, trying to get all the various moving pieces in uh, one some what I would say a succinct motion. So thank you for providing that um, printout or whatever towards the latter part, because I was going to ask you to go back to it. So basically, if council decides to support those two that were listed as the staff recommendations, that would not include paid parking unless council specified. And it would also retain the special parking provision areas that quite frankly, both Councillor Chisholm and I have found extremely positive for people in the area. And uh, I think more so than the parking, it's that overflow parking that seems to be the issue for them because Councillor Chisholm has indicated he goes by on a repeated basis to check Tannery Park and there's quite a few parking spots available so the parking there doesn't seem to be the issue but again the overflow seems to be more of it um the dusk parking um you were saying something about and i appreciate the clarification regarding dusk being 10 p.m and the fact that um you're not going to be permitting parking after that point are you going to be enforcing that or is that something that's on a a random basis that somebody just does a cursory drive-through. I'm trying to understand from uh, an enforcement standpoint. Do you want to take? I'm going to let uh, Director Barry answer the enforcement. So. And uh, Councillor, I'm sure the commissioner will add that uh, whatever whatever is planned for patrolling is we will we will respond to complaints as we always do. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I was uh, almost exactly going to say that. Uh, definitely by complaint, and officers will respond. Uh, there's no doubt if an officer is in the area, they would uh, they would observe what's there. But uh, we uh, we appreciate all the information we can get from the community. Thank you very much. Um, at the appropriate time, I'd be pleased to give you a motion. Um, as I say, both uh, Council Chisholm and myself have been quite emphatic that we're opposed to paid parking. And so at the appropriate time, we'd be pleased to give you a motion. Thank you, Councillor. I accept your motion. Uh, it's always in order to move a motion, but uh, we will now continue with questions, but at least we know who's gonna move it. Uh, Councillor Chisholm, are you ready to take a turn? Thank you, Worship. Um, count my colleague, Councillor Duddick, has uh, articulated very well what our, our, our feelings are with respect to the, uh, the paid parking. Um, just one comment, and I know it, it, and Hanya, excellent report. Thank you for the detail. Thank you for 
decluttering the confusion I had with respect to how the paid parking was kind of melded into this. I'm glad we got that extrapolated out. With respect to uh, Tannery Park and Brawny Beach, there are differences and uh, just so there might be some slight differences with respect to how uh, the recommendations come out if the recommendations of both parks are, are satisfactory to council, so be it. However, I go down to Tannery Park every day or three times a day and the issue is not about parking. Uh, the issue the issue in the park in the park itself, there's always adequate um, parking stalls at the lower level, the top level, and also waterworks uh, uh, parking areas. So that doesn't seem the issue. The issue's always been the traffic that's coming down uh, and the parking on, on the streets and having the special provision area has um, really assisted us in, in uh, leading the pressures of, of the residents with respect to illegal parking and so forth. So that's all I have to say. Uh, my thanks to the staff for uh, following up on, on our requests with the parking. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chisholm. Um, Councillor O'Meara, are, are you ready to take a turn? Yep, thank you, Your Worship. Um, thanks again to staff. I'm, I'm curious if we know how many uh, people out of those numbers from Envronix were Oakville residents or how many people from outside of Oakville or Halton um, were, were using the parks. I'm wondering if we, we, we know those numbers. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe there is some information about the distance people are traveling to the parks. This is information that, um, that uh, park staff, uh, Chris Mark, shared with us with respect to the visits. So there may be more details on that. We were just looking at overall numbers. Okay, can you share? Can somebody share that information then? We'll request um, 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 Chris Mark to, uh, if they have that information, that, that we can share that with council, definitely. Thank you. Mr. Mark, are you there, and do you have that ready to hand? Hello, Mr. Mark. Uh, good evening, Mayor Burton. Yes, we um, we do have that information. We can certainly share that with Councilor Amiri and the remainder of Council. Um, I would say that there is a, a high number of people who in 2020 traveled more than t uh, 12 kilometers to come to uh, Brawny Beach, uh, as well as uh, Coronation Park, but in particular Brawny Beach. Um, so I can certainly, that's just a highlight that I can remember from the report, but we can certainly circulate uh, to Councilor Mayor. And, and Mr. Mark, just to assist you, is it not true that in both our harbors, um, I, I'm reminded that uh, some of our slips are rented to out of towners. There's a mix of in town and out of town, isn't that right? That is correct, Mayor Burton. We both have in town and out of town uh, customers. Councillor O'Meara. Okay, thanks. Um, and does does this plan also include those security uh, people at the mouth of um, Brawny Beach going into there, like we had last year? Does would that include security people monitoring traffic going in and out? Ms. Ellison or Mr. Mark. Um, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, as. Um, um, Director Barry mentioned earlier with respect to the parks, uh, the level of service through various officers, ambassadors, parks officers. Um, they have a number of staff that are there at um, um, static times to try and help mitigate traffic flow and entry into the parks and are directing uh, visitors to the appropriate areas. And, and they do have signs to say when the lot is full. Okay, so there's there's going to be intermittent times where people are there, or there won't be people from Friday night till Sunday evening will be staffing that lot, saying it's full. Don't use people's driveways to turn around, keep going. I mean, I mean, I'm, I still don't see how this is going to stop five thousand people from driving down to use Ronnie Beach. I, I just I don't see how this plan does that, and 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 then they show up and there's no place to park and then we have the chaos that we had we have people deciding trying to go somewhere i just i'm 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 unsure how we have solved that problem or addressed that problem 
Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to the councillor, I, I would suggest that we probably haven't, we haven't stopped people from coming down. Will we have staff there? We do have static park officers in the area. And as uh, Ms. Allison has indicated that um, we, we also have, the officers will be, um, will be using a board to indicate when the lot is full. Um, as the next tier, we then have the special provision area, which um, stops the uh, traffic from going and parking in the direct vicinity of the park and, and making a mess of those roads. But are vehicles still going to come down and are they still going to attempt to use the park and are they still going to find a, a lot full? Yeah, they will, they will still find that. This is really about trying to mitigate the impact when that happens. Okay, um, and and I say that, and I'm you know I'm I, I'm I appreciate the difficulty here, and and uh, I will support the motion, but I'm I'm you know I I would have liked to have seen some kind of a of a, um, a conservation halt in area. I know the costs were were fairly prohibitive, but um, again, even if there's a way, you know, we don't have to mail out permits to people. They can also go online and pull a permit if they live here and, and put that on their dash too. So uh, I hope this goes away after this year. I hope, you know, the chaos settles down when, when COVID does, but um, I'm just, uh, I'm worried that we're going to have the same issues as we had last summer. So anyway, I just wanted to say that on, on, on the record here for, for all of the people in the Brawny area who are living here and are waiting with bated breath to see how we're going to control this. So thank you very much, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor O'Meara. Um, Councillor uh, Giddings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, I appreciate that this is a, a, a pilot project and it's going to be monitored for uh, a couple of a couple of years. My question is, how will the locations be monitored so that we know? if the desired effect is occurring. I guess with Tannery, I look at, uh, it's easy to you know go up and go across the creek and go down to Lakeside, and Lakeside's not going to have um, any, you know, any, of, any of these works in place. So I'm, my first question is how quickly can we get feedback back to council in terms of any unintended consequences that may occur okay um, counselor I'll take a first stab at that um, we have built a beautiful system for uh, counting and keeping track of uh, the dimensions of issues and that that tool is service Oakville and tracking numbers are issued for each call and so if counselors when they receive a complaint will make sure that service Oakville also knows so that it can be tracked. You will be doing yourself and your colleagues a favor. And I know in your case you do that, but uh, that, that is a really important tool we should not lose sight of because that's in addition to a dispatch machine, it's a counting machine. And those are good things here. Um, uh, Ms. Ellison, do you have further information for the counselor? No, I think that was a that provides um, uh, the best statistics will be through uh, through service Oakville as well. We will be looking and monitoring how many um, how many tickets are issued in each of the areas. Um, should council approve the new uh, the violations and um, the amending bylaws, so we will have those inf that information as well. So Mr. Barry is going to come and help with this. Um, I imagine Mr. Barry will reassure council that we're not going to ignore the other parks. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's absolutely correct. And I, and I will highlight that um, uh, with the special provision areas, um, we d there is a process in there. So if an area, Lakeside, Arkendo, Garlock, uh, other areas near Coronation, if, if, they, um, if they find there's an issue, um, there is a process to extend or in install special provision areas in those areas to also deal with that problem. So I think that's, that's important because we have that flexibility. Um, but uh, as Ms. Elson indicated, we also will be monitoring all of the impacts of this as we go forward. So if we do see uh, um, any type of impact that um, is unexpected, um, we have the ability to come to council and, and we, do, um, we do have other options we can look at depending on the issues that, that arise. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Uh, Councillor Giddings, is, did you get a good answer in, in any of that? Uh, 
received a good answer. I, thank you for that. And I appreciate uh, Mr. Berry mentioning Arkendo and Chancery and, and the uh, Promenade and, and a number of others. It, it's an ongoing concern. And I just, uh, you know, we obviously all have to do our part to be welcoming and to and to encourage good behaviors. Unfortunately, uh, all too often, uh, those behaviors are pretty poor. And my concern is that we're going to uh, funnel more and more people into a smaller space. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Giddings. Councillor Adams and then Councillor Robertson. And then if Councillor Romero's hand is up for a second time, we'll come back to Councillor Romero and otherwise we'll, we won't. Councillor Adams. Thanks very much. I, I'm, I'll lower my hand right away so I'm not caught in the same category. Um, first, I, first of all, I, I totally agree about the paid parking and, uh, and what Councillor Duddock was uh, saying earlier. I fully support the removal of that uh, particular option. I just wanted a clarification on the three, the uh, number of hours parking limit. As I read it, and I understand the staff report, that is not part of uh, what's being proposed. So there's no proposal to have a uh, a three hour parking limit within the parks. Is that correct? That is correct. At this time, there's no proposal for a time limit, just the, that the parks close at 10 o'clock. Great. That's, that's fantastic. I'm very, very pleased about that. Um, the last thing I was a little bit nervous about and continue to be a bit nervous about is the use of the, uh, the SPA um, parking provisions uh, around so, so many of the neighborhoods in, in those areas. And it's one of the things that uh, I know that Councillor Liz Chin and I hear about regularly from our residents is um, a sentiment of it being an, uh, an unfair application of uh, parking prohibitions uh, that, that we've invested all this money in the, the waterfront and now we can't get down there. Um, uh, and I understand from what you've said that we've nearly doubled, is it nearly a doubling or something of the, uh, the traffic, the number of people going to those waterfront parks. Um, in 2019, pre-pandemic, were we seeing these kind of parking problems on the side streets to the same degree that we were seeing them in, in 2020? Your Southern councillors would tell you yes. And but in any event, I should, I should give you a procedural note. The SPA is our council policy in this term of council, and it will take 10 votes to change those. I understand that. Um, my, but I'm asking the question as to whether it... Uh, continues to be, um, or if it was uh, an issue to the same degree as it was in 2020. Um, my, my information from your colleagues across Lakeshore is yes. I've seen people so desperate to go to the park that they think nothing of blocking the driveway of a resident, which I hope you'll agree is a, just a little bit Any, much. I, I appreciate that's an egregious um, misuse of somebody's driveway. Um, I guess, do staff have uh, parking ticket numbers or anything like that that we could use as a, um, uh, a bar or a, a yardstick for measuring that? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, we show we do have numbers from 2019 around uh, Brawny Beach, just as we use that as a comparison. So May to September in 2019, we had um, 137 tickets at the, the Brawny Beach Park. And for the same time in 2020, we had over 500 tickets. Okay, so that's, a, that's our yardstick, uh, and that's a pretty good yardstick. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Um, I believe Councillor Robertson is next, and then uh, because of, uh, and, and, uh, and then it'll be Councillor Hazard Thiel because Councillor Romero took down his, his sign. So, Councillor Robertson. Uh, thank you for the report, Hanya. I, um, I understand people's hesitancy in terms of paid parking. I also understand the pressure that we have to create more parking uh, so people can safely park down at the beaches and, and in other places in town. Um, reminding ourselves that only parking pays for parking here. How do we propose to gain more parking without paid parking? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, at this time with um, at Brawny Marina, 
In 2018, uh, due to overflow parking issues and number of issues in the area, we implemented a temporary parking lot using existing resources. There was some cost with respect to signage. Um, we're looking to do that as, um, again this year should Council um, approve the recommendations. Um, there is minimal cost um, with that. Uh, I think the biggest will really be signage and a lot of it will be really um, communication to say that that is available parking. It is about an eight minute walk uh, as Google uh, map shows so that if you know if someone wants to go to the park they may want to drop off some of their you know depending on how many people they have according to COVID restrictions, um, but it is only an eight minute walk from the marina to, uh, to, the, to the Brawny Beach Park. And how many more spots does that give us? Um, I apologize right now, I do not recall and I don't think I have it with my notes here. Okay. I can and, get uh, back I just to you. Sorry, I just want to go back to Councillor Adams in terms of the public. When we did SPAs, why did we do them on both sides of the street and not make it one side only? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, many of the streets in the uh, special provision areas are already signed one side parking, so um, it wouldn't really restrict the parking. There are areas where uh, parking is permitted on both sides. Uh, to keep it uniform and easy to implement and easy to understand that the parking was restricted everywhere. Again, residents were provided permits for themselves and their guests should they need them to temporarily park on the street. Thank you. I'm not opposed to it at all. I just wanted the public to understand why we did both sides for it. Um, and I will support the motion. I just, there is times when I look at Coronation and I look at Brawny Beach and I look at the chaos of parking and always wonder when some little kid is going to get hurt because nobody's looking for a little kid. They're just looking for parking and, uh, and hoping that maybe post COVID that issue will resolve itself. But for now, thank you for everything you've done and for the enforcement for everything. Thank you very much, Councillor Robertson. Councillor Hazlitt Neal. Um, thank you, Mayor Burton. Um, I have a few follow up questions. Could, um, could you just confirm, is there a static officer at Lakeside um, uh, on the weekends? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, at Lakeside does not have a static officer. It is on the patrol list for the parks officers. Okay, so um, I, on behalf of a neighborhood that does see overflow coming um, from other areas, and it is, a, you know, it is a prize destination. I, I, I hesitate saying that because uh, it just keeps getting better and better uh, in terms of the volume. Um, I would suggest that um, there be consideration that somebody needs to be there um, more than just a few trips of the day. Um, the parking on front is um, is hazardous on a normal day. Um, just because of the quaintness of the historical district um, and uh, having uh, regular um, somebody there throughout the day would, would be beneficial. Um, so I leave that with you to, to comment. Um, I wanted to thank um, uh, Municipal Enforcement for um, uh, moving forward with at least one of our uh, requests, which was the, that uh, the Performing Arts Center have a some signage that encourages people to park in the parking garage downtown. Um, but there is a, uh, an additional uh, uh, request from Lakeside Residents Association that if, if uh, staff could comment on it uh, sometime this week in regards to options of having the parking garage open in the evening and potentially even being free in the evening to uh, detract people um, uh, off the streets versus um, an SPA um, uh, in the lakeside area. Um, my other um, question is around uh, the uh, how SPAs are actually executed. So uh, thank you for the, the note from Councillor Robertson around um, it's two sides of the street, but it is a, a majority of the residents on the street that determine whether the SPA would be put in place. 
So through you, Mr. Mayor, um, as was outlined in the staff report, April 26, um, they're implemented after consultation with the ward councillors and the residents. So what has happened um, is that the request comes to staff's attention. The area is reviewed with traffic engineering staff. A survey is sent out to the affected properties, the residents in the affected properties, and if there's significant support, they, we move forward with it. Okay. So my understanding from Director Barry earlier today was that um, some of the SPA uh, requests that uh, Councillor Giddings and I had um, were temporarily on hold until this was resolved. So um, if, uh, if, is it more of a majority on a street because we're worried about the circumference. We, we, we limit on one street, we're just moving it up a block and we're moving it up one more block and over one block. And, and frankly, there's, it, it, it's, it's, it can go fairly far. So is there advice or um, a process? Is there a brochure that explains to people the ramifications of that um, when you're having the consultation? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the information that is sent out with the survey explains what, what it means and it outlines the locations that we're looking at in SPA. I think logistically when staff are looking at it, they look at what would be reasonable uh, distances and cutoffs so that they're not cutting off, say, at in the middle of a block or um, um, I think mostly yeah, more in the middle of a block. So they're looking at what are sort of logical cutoffs for the area and within those distances. Um, all right, thank you for that. Um, and I just want to thank um, uh, Director Mark for uh, helping us with some of the Gerlach, um, uh overflow over the last couple of weekends. And hopefully we'll get um, that sign up that allows us to say the, the lot's full um, and uh, that'll help stop traffic from backing up over the hill and onto uh, Lakeshore Road, which uh, is incredibly dangerous, but people still do it. Um, so thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, Council, I don't see any more questions, and I'm wondering if you'd like me to put the vote on Councillor Duddick's motion. I don't see an objection, so if you are opposed to Councillor... Is there any opposition to the motion? Madam Clerk, there's no uh, objection uh, that I can see. Just looking again to be sure. I've got a hand from Councillor Duddick. You're not objecting to your own motion, I don't think. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I just wanted to speak to it, Your Worship. Um, I wanted to thank staff for all their hard work in compiling all the information and having to go back yet again to come back to us with this uh, further information, giving us the opportunity to review options. Um, both Councillor Chisholm and I have been extremely adamant about not charging for paid parking in our parks. As we stated before, the parks are built and funded by our taxpayer dollars. It seems wrong to turn around and charge the very people who built those parks to have to pay for parking to, to enjoy them. And I guess more importantly, we have to remind ourselves, this was town-wide funding that went into these parks, even though they're located in South Oakville. So for us to have something where it would restrict paid parking, that would mean that people in North Oakville would be in a disadvantage. And those who are in close proximity, they could walk, they could bike. But for somebody in the far reaches of the community, the only thing they have available is either public transportation or a car. So um, once again, I think we have to get away from the north versus south or east versus west, and all of us should come together and enjoy our parks. Thank you, Councillor. Um, if there's an, uh, if, is there an objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. I declare the motion carried unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Councillor, if you'll turn your attention now to item 9.3, the Climate Emergency Declaration Progress Report. The motion is to receive the report. Uh, Tricia Henderson, our environmental coordinator, is available for questions, and she has a, uh, a summary presentation if you're interested. But the, the uh, meat of the matter before us is to uh, 
approve the memorandum of understanding with the Halton Environmental Network regarding a collaboration to continue to deliver the Oakville Ready program and to uh, authorize the solicitor to make any necessary reasonable minor modifications to the memorandum and to execute the memorandum. How do you wish to proceed? Uh, Councillor Chisholm? I would move the recommendation, Your Worship. Thank you. I saw uh, Councillor Longo. I would uh, second the motion. If we weren't in committee of the whole, we'd need a seconder. But uh, thank you very much. For then the I spirit. withdraw my seconding of the motion. <laughs> it's okay. We appreciate the spirit of support. Um, may I put the vote? Is there any objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. The motion carries unanimously. Council, um, uh, the next matter is a, a fairly pleasant one. Uh, your March 31st, 2021 financial results. There's a presentation if you need it. Uh, and otherwise, uh, all you have to do is receive the report. Uh, what's your pleasure? Councillor Adams. I'd be happy to move the uh, staff recommendation to receive it. Thank you very much. Is there an objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, Council, the next item is the confidential discussion item. It's an authorization request from Oakville Enterprises. I believe that it's self-explanatory, and I wonder if you're willing to move it. Councillor Duddick? Thank you. Is there any objection to... Uh, pardon? No. Oh. Oh, I'll go back in just a second. Uh, Councillor Duddick has moved it. Is there any objection? There being none, that's carried. Councillor, let me just back up. I turned that last page too fast. Uh, we have the Municipal Code of Conduct Consultation and Strengthening Accountability motion uh, from me. Uh, uh, what do you want to do with that? Councillor Grant, you're moving it. Certainly, uh, it's a good report, and uh, I will uh, move to receive the motion. Thank you very much. To approve it, I believe, right? Thank you. Any objection to the motion? There's none. Madam Clerk, it carries. Thank you, Council, very much. Um, now, um, we, we do not have any advisory committee minute uh, to approve or receive. And it's uh, now would be in order for a motion to rise and report. We just need one person to do that. Councilor Longo, thank you. Any objection? There being no objection, uh, the uh, motion to rise and report carries. I rise and report the Committee of the Whole has met and made recommendations on consent items 7.1234 and 5, confidential consent item 8.1, discussion items 9.1234 and 5, confidential discussion item 10.1, as noted by the clerk. Now I have a mover and seconder for the report. Councillor Knoll, Councillor Elgar, thank you. Any objection? Madam Clerk, there is none, and the motion carries. Uh, Council, you've had your information items circulated electronically and your status of outstanding issues report. And uh, we now come to new business, and there is quite a bit. Uh, so first, uh, because new business is for emergency matters, congratulatory matters, condolences, and notices of motion, we have a little bit of, of uh, several of these. And I'd like to start by uh, asking you to join me in recognizing the Afsal family, many of whom live here in Oakville, and, uh, and a number of them, four of them, were, were uh, killed by a terrorist in London uh, last week. And uh, one member of that family is, uh, was injured and, and is recovering, but uh, is deprived of his parents and his sister. Uh, Friends and relatives uh, uh, in Oakville are, are very uh, uh, horrified by what happened, as well as are all of us. So um, that leads us to a point where we realize that we have to work harder than ever on uh, inclusion and equity and uh, diversity. Uh, and we, we need to join with the Muslim community to fight Islamophobia, and I'd like to invite you to join me in a moment of silence to honor the Asphalt family.
Thank you, Council. Um, now, Council, I, I, I have a little bit of a special request to make of you. Um, Councilor Lischina is desirous of, uh, as I notified you, FC FCM is accepting applications to be on their committees, and we circulated to you a request for any of you who, who wished to. Councilor Lischina would, would like to apply for one. She needs the support of council in order to qualify to apply. So I would like to ask you to waive the procedure bylaw so that uh, we could then vote to support her application. Councillor Palmer, are you moving, uh, waiving the bylaw? Thank you very much. Is there any objection to waiving the bylaw? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. The bylaw is waived. And now, could I get someone to move uh, our approval of her application? Councillor Knoll, thank you very much. Is there any objection to the motion? Oh, that's right. We came out of Committee of the Whole. So, uh, uh, Councillor uh, Chisholm had his hand up, so he'll be the seconder. Took me a second to adjust. We just rose from Committee of the Hall, didn't we? Uh, is there any objection to the motion by Councillor Noll and Councillor Chisholm? There being none, uh, and thank you, Madam Clerk, for your help with that. Uh, that's carried unanimously, and uh, uh, the, the clerk and I will issue the paper for you, Councillor Lischina, and we wish you well in the, in the competition. Uh, and now the next item is uh, in accordance with section 14.1.2 of the procedure bylaw, the following notices of motion will be considered at the next council meeting for on July 5th. And the first is the uh, motion printed in the agenda from uh, Councillor Robertson, which, which I have been happy to second. And uh, that is the prioritization, prioritization of OHIP covered eye care. And uh, the uh, and let's see now. I think that covers all the items for this section. But Councillor Duddick may have a surprise for me. Councillor Duddick. Sorry, press the wrong button. Um, Your Worship, I don't know if it would be appropriate if we would waive the procedural bylaw and hear the motion this evening from Councillor Robertson and yourself, given the time constraints that I see September is fast approaching that this deadline needs to be addressed, um, I'd be willing to give you a motion to waive the procedural so it could be dealt with at this evening's mo or meeting, rather. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you've made Councillor Robertson and myself very happy, and uh, you've probably made Oakville's ophthalmologists very happy as well. So uh, uh, can I have a second over Councillor Duddick's motion? Councillor Adams, thank you. Is there any objection to the motion to waive the procedure by law by Councillor Duddick and Councillor Adams? Madam Clerk, I see no objection. The matter is, that's carried. Uh, Councillor Robertson, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's your platform now. Thank you, uh, Mayor. And for um, the public, can I just suggest you read it as well as speak to it? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I want to first thank Ruth Sheridan, who does amazing things with the people with um, eyesight and vision problems in Oakville, people with limited vision, and she brought it to the seniors working advisory group in terms of what was happening, and I think that people don't realize what will happen in September. But in September, optometrists, not ophthalmologists, optometrists, will be taking a job action as of September 1st. And that is for any children up to the age of 19 and any seniors 65 and over who currently have eye testing done at an optometrist under OHIP. In the past 30 years, OHIP has underfunded optometrists. They've had a 9% raise in 30 years. And at this point, they're taking a job action. And their job action is basically that they will not be seeing children or seniors and directing them to their family doctor for any eye problems. Because of this, we think it's very important that the provincial government knows that children and seniors are vital to us, their vision is vital to us, and we would like to do this motion. 
Whereas routine eye care is critical in early detection of eye diseases like glaucoma, cataracts, and macular degeneration, and the health of eyes is critical to overall health and quality of life. Whereas conditions that may be detected with an annual eye exam include diabetes mellitus, glaucoma, cataract, retinal disease, ableophobia, <laughs> uh, lazy eye, visual field defects, loss of part of the usual field of vision, corneal disease, strabismus, which is crossed eyes, recurrent uvitis, and inflammation of the uvea, the middle area of the eye that consists of the iris, ciliary body, and choroid, optic pathway disease. Whereas payments from OHIP have only increased 9% over the last 30 years, which has not come close to matching inflation of costs, which include rent, staff, utilities, equipment, taxes, and supplies. Whereas the lack of funding makes it difficult to invest in modern technology and newer technology means earlier detection of eye disease. Whereas the provincial government has refused to formally negotiate with optometrists for over 30 years, resulting in optometrists subsidizing the cost to deliver eye care to Ontarians, absorbing costs of approximately $173 million annually. Whereas the 2021 Ontario budget did not address OHIP insured eye care, Ontario optometrists took action and voted to withdraw OHIP services starting September 1st, 2021, unless the government agrees to legally binding negotiations to fund these services, at least to the cost of delivery. Whereas this job action will jeopardize good eye, eye care for those who need the care of an optometrist the most and will have the greatest impact on the most vulnerable groups, children whose lifetime, whose lifetime ability to learn and develop depends on good vision, and to the elderly who are at the greatest risk for visioning threatening, vision threatening ocular diseases. Therefore, be it resolved that the town of Oakville requests the provincial government to recognize the value that access to quality eye care that optometrists bring to all Ontarians and act now to protect it. That the provincial government address the OHIP insured eye care immediately and enter into legally binding negotiations to fund these services at least to the cost of delivery prior to any job action taking place. And that a copy of this resolution be forwarded to Premier Ford, uh, Minister of Health, Christine Elliott, MPPs, Effie Trantopophilopoulos, and Stephen Crawford, the Ontario Association of Optometrists and the Halton Region to seek their support and be made publicly available. And I ask for your confirmation of this motion. Thank you very much, Councillor Robertson. Uh, you, you stated the case very well. I will not prolong the meeting by echoing what you said, but I do support it. Uh, Council, I would ask you for a recorded vote and as is our new custom during Zoom meetings anyway, um, let it be done by the clerk recording us all in support if that is the case. And otherwise we'll, we'll have a, a bit of a roll call. Is there any objection to the motion and the plan? Madam Clerk, there is no objection. Please, uh, please record this as a recorded vote in unanimous support. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Swag. The, the next item that I have in front of me for you is the request for a report on gypsy moth infestation efforts uh, brought to us by Councillor Adams and Councillor Lischina. Um, I believe it's in your agenda and that you had a chance to read it. Um, uh, if the councillors don't need to speak, Councillor Adams, would you like to speak to it? Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to speak to it briefly in as much as I have uh, two minor uh, additions to what's before you. That is to add um, after what's uh, the, the third point uh, to, add, to continue that line with and things residents in general can do to help manage gypsy moth infestations and for staff report on any other viable options to manage gypsy moth infestations during 2021. Um, and I'm hoping that staff would be able to, to provide the report in time for uh, any aerial um, uh, spraying uh, improvements to be made in the uh, upcoming year. Thank you very much. Uh, Council, uh, uh, 
May I put the vote on the request for report as amended by the councillor or adjusted by the councillor? Uh, is there any objection to the request for report? Uh, Mayor, Mayor Burton, just on that uh, with the report, uh, I just wonder, Councillor Adams, is there anything like with what you just wrote in, does that include what we can do to get rid of the, the eggs also later on this summer? Like would staff be coming back this summer to help help staff uh, know like something say okay this is a public tree you should know there's a lot of eggs in the tree like for staff to be notified of the areas also so that they can get out and do th something well that that's why i i specifically said any other viable options uh because there are some things that will work in some cases and in other cases they won't i know that some residents are using some insecticides which may or may not be viable for the town to use in a broader sense. They might work on a, a single tree that you might have on your property that's easy to access, but it might not work in a forest. Um, and so that's why I'm asking staff to tell us if there are other things that can be done. Um, and to, for example, what, to what extent could egg scraping be done? Uh, hey, okay, this is, that's really good because also pheromone traps that uh, residents can install. They're like uh, in their own properties to catch the, so they, then the, they can't, they, the eggs then they, they won't hatch if we catch the males. Right. So the question is, is that something that staff think that we could do in a, in a more, a broader sense, or is it just not viable at a town wide level? I appreciate that. No, that's good. Cause if they could come back with that information this summer and I agree, look to the spraying, you know, we can't do anything now for more spraying than what we've done, but in 2022, uh, that sounds fantastic. So, you know, there's st stuff that hopefully we can do this summer and fall to stop the infestation, which it, it's pockets. It's not so bad in Oakville compared to a lot of other areas, but it could be. So I thank you for bringing that motion forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Elgar. Councillor Chisholm. Thank you, Worship. Uh, so, uh, to Councillor Adams, um, the timing on this, uh, are you looking for next next year uh, application or different uh, creative ways of, of eradicating uh, the gypsy moth? Because I think we might be a little bit late for this year for anything to be done, uh, any action by staff uh, at this point in time. Can, can I, I staff comment on that? Sorry. So, so I understand that we're too late for the aerial spraying for this year. Um, that part of it is certainly aimed at the 2022 aerial spraying program, as I understand it. Um, and my other part is asking if there are any other things that could be done uh, during the rest of this year. And the answer might be no, there's nothing really that could be done. Um, and if staff have further information, I'd be happy to hear it. Yes, and as Councillor Elgar brought out there, there's hypothetically egg scraping and other pheromone traps and so on. So um, we'll get a report and we'll all be the wiser for it. So may I put the vote? Any objection to the request for report? Madam Clerk, there is no objection. The, the report request is approved. Thank you, everybody. Um, does, anybody have, does anybody else have anything else? Because if you don't, it's time for a mover and seconder for the bylaws. Councillor Longo and Councillor Adams. Moving the bylaws, I take it. Thank you. Any objection to the bylaws as presented in the agenda and noted by the clerk? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. The bylaws are uh, adopted. Uh, Council, it's been terrific working with you. And uh, I, uh, I have to say, you've now ended the meeting by completing the work on the agenda. Uh, good night, everybody.